OK, I, I, I start to talk in Catalan later in English, if you allow me, that it's not a problem. It's not a big problem for you. No. Uh, hola, bona tarda a tots. Gràcies per uh, estar en aquest webinar. Com sabeu, és una sessió clínica intramural de Fundació ACE. Són les nostres sessions del dimarts a la tarda. I uh, aquestes sessions, la passada i la d'avui, la volem dedicar a la, a la COVID, a la pandèmia. Però amb, aquest, amb aquesta sessió ho volem focalitzar i volem posar èmfasi en quines són les diferències de comportament que té el COVID amb, amb el gènere. O sigui, com ens comportem les dones davant del COVID, quin és l'impacte, perquè hi ha un impacte social molt important, però quin és l'impacte biològic, quines diferències tenim en quant a risc i protecció en passar una infecció de Covid més o menys virulenta o amb certs trets diferencials d'una i l'altra. I per això hem convidat a la doctora Maria Teresa Ferretti, que és una molt bona amiga meva i que començaré a presentar-la en anglès. Uh, Maria Teresa, thank you very much to, uh, as, to set this, uh, to share with us your knowledge and to share with us uh, this uh, very special session because that is an exceptional period and that is an exceptional topic for us. And I, I want to introduce you in two different manners. First one, uh, about my, relations, my relationship with you. Because my relation, my relation, uh, my personal relation with uh, Maria Teresa is through the Women's Brain Project. Mm? And we met in the past, I don't remember very well, three, four years, when the European Human Health Initiative uh, uh, prepared one, one, one day meeting to talking about women and health. And the president was uh, Peggy McGill that it's included in the Mopiat project from the, the IMI project. And uh, I met you, I met, uh, I met Antonella, I met a lot of women that it was interesting in how is the role of the women in the world, how is the, how is the risk in the, in the different options of the risk in the, in the disease and uh, the different um, men and women. And another one interesting project that is Woman Brain Project. Okay. And uh, Maria Teresa Ferretti is working for more than 10 years, uh, focus in Alzheimer's disease and in the basic research, as you can see in the next slide. But that she is a co founder of this beautiful project, the Woman's Brain Project. And the Woman's Brain Project includes. includes many different diseases. One of them is Alzheimer's disease, dementia, migraine, multiple sclerosis, depression. And uh, as, a, as a chief or scientific officer, she has a lot of uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, publications. One of them is one beautiful and astonishing paper who describes very well the difference from sex and uh, brain and different disease, focus on immunology. And this is a paper, a reference paper in order to understand how it's happened in the, in, in, when we are include gender in our, in our uh, landscape. And uh, she's a good speaker. She has beautiful tech talks. I, I invite to follow the text of uh, Maria Teresa, and she's uh, a, a journalist in the in the journals, prestigious uh, journals like BBC, Science, Financial Times, but the most important is Nature and uh, PNS. But who is the Maria Teresa in their background or in their um, and their specialities? Uh, in uh, and to talk about today. She's pharmaceutical chemistry and she was get the, the master on pharmaceutical and chemistry in the University of Calgary, Italy, moved to the Harlow, uh, Harlow England in, uh, in the Center of Excellence Drug Discovery. 
here with us there are people they are one uh, uh, professional he was working in drug discovery it's very interesting topic and in very interesting area in the more frequent from the pharmaceutical companies and you are working with glad so as my client and uh, in 2011 you attend your phd in pharmacology and therapeutics in the McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And the PhD is focused on the role of inflammation in early pre stage of Alzheimer's disease. This time you are moved to Europe. You live from, uh, from um, uh, the Zurich with a, a very prestigious lab from Professor Nietzsche, and you are focused in research in immunophenotyping. You lead, eh? Maria Teresa leads a team. He's uh, focused to understand indeed the immunophenotype and focus in uh, gender and in uh, to identify novel biomarkets for increasing individual level of prediction on cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. That is their background, like academic background, and the other from their position in the Women's Brain Project is another background that is interesting background to lead in Europe how it's happened around gender. Teresa, thank you very much to be here for your time and for sharing with her your knowledge, your expertise, and your hypothesis and expectation. That is your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Merced, for this kind invitation. And uh, hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's a honor. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Boada for the invitation and the colleagues at the Fundacio ACE for their support for allowing me to be here today. And um, we have about an hour, an hour and a half for this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to show you a lot of things, but I, I also would like to have this as interactive as possible. Um, I would like to hear your feedback. So uh, keep in mind that you can always send questions during the conversation, during the presentation. This will be collected and there will be specific allocated times during my presentation to actually read some of the questions and have a bit of, uh, of a discussion about them. So um, I'm really looking forward to have this as interactive as, uh, as possible. So what I'm going to do now is to share my screen and uh, start with the slides. Let's see if this works as it should. I hope you can see my presentation now, the first slide. Uh, so let's start. The title of my presentation is COVID Sex Differences and Clinical Trials. And what I would really like to do today is to make the case for the importance of sex and gender in medicine. So COVID-19 is one of the many, many diseases where we do notice the sex and gender differences. It just so happened there is such an emergency right now in the world that there is, it has really brought into the spotlight how important the sex differences are and people are paying attention. And so what I would like to do today is really to guide you um, and to suggest how starting from COVID, we can discuss the role of both sex and gender and how we could leverage these differences for improving the way we do research and medicine. Ma, the agenda I'm proposing for today is, is, is built like this. I would like first to provide, to give an introduction. Um, what is gender? What is sex? Are they exactly the same? What is gender medicine? What is the Women's Brain Project? Uh, then we will deep dive into sex differences that are known up to now in, uh, in COVID in a couple of data sets. At this point, I would like to have the first question and answer uh, slot. So it would be very nice to read some of your questions and, and see what are your comments and inputs uh, into this first uh, part. Then we will move on and uh, as uh, Mercedes has mentioned, I would like to touch on the gender dimension as well, how men and women behave, what is their role in the society and how this also plays a role in the pandemic. And finally, very important for me, um, the final part of the presentation, I would like to highlight what are, in my opinion, the learnings, what are the lessons that we can take uh, out of all this data, all this observation in COVID, which could be applied for COVID and in general for precision medicine. And again, we will have another slot with question and answers. 
So let's start with introduction, sex and gender, gender medicine and women's brain project. Uh, normally, when I when I have a normal seminar at this point, I would just ask the, the audience to tell me, do you know what is sex? Do you know what is gender? Do you know if they're different? And we would start a discussion like that. I can't really do that right now, but let me just ask you, uh, because many people think that sex and gender are kind of synonymous. We tend to use them in, in interchangeably, but actually they refer to two very different concepts. And I would like to highlight that here when we talk about sex. We are referring to biology, basically. So those traits that are determined by the expression of sexual chromosomes, so XX or XY, and the hormones that come with it, and then the secondary sexual traits. So sex is really biology, while and it's with few exceptions that I acknowledge, but in the vast majority of cases, sex is binary, male and female. On the other hand, we have gender, what it means to be man or woman, and this changes according to the society. So gender is a socio-economic construct which relates to the position that a man or a woman um, covers or occupies in a society. So it changes in different societies, can be different in different historical periods, it can change. Um, it, it's strictly linked, uh, related to issues like edu access to education, job attainment, wealth. Um, and also health and, um, and and it's not binary as, as we all know gender is much more complex it's nuanced uh, so uh, this has to be taken into consideration as well now these are not my words but i'm gonna quote the the world health organization in saying that both sex and gender are determinants of health so what we have to start thinking about right now is that whether we are a man or a woman can affect our health in terms of what diseases we're going to get, how we're going to respond to diseases. Uh, so our risk, our treatments um, and uh, the presentation of the disease as well. So let's talk a bit more about this and I'm going to focus on sex for now. So sex differences. Why? being a man or a woman should make a difference in pathology in medicine and I see basically these three cases. So there are some diseases that uh, occur only in one sex. Um, the typical example is prostate cancer and uh, okay this is quite obvious they will not happen this will not happen in, in women. Then there are some other conditions that are simply more frequent in one sex. So you see patients and 70%, 80% of them are female, for instance. And a typical example of this is lupus. Uh, a lot of um, neuroimmunological conditions have a female uh, prevalence, but we also have diseases that are more prevalent in men. And this is something that we have to know, we have to acknowledge. And um, finally, we have conditions which present differently in people of one sex as compared to the other sex. Most conditions will fall into this category. Um, the typical example that I give is stroke, and I'm sure that you know more than I do on this, uh, but in stroke we have different risk factors as well as different disease symptoms, um, which often lead to misdiagnosis in women, as well as different treatments uh, in, in, in response to treatment in men and women. So most conditions will fall into this category. But then the question that comes after this is really, does it matter? Do we want to know these differences? What do I do with this information? And I would just like to give you a preview and then I, I, I hope we will have a, a more discussion later on on this. But just to give you an example of how relevant it can be, the difference between men and women in disease, I want to bring up a uh, work by Jeff Mogil, which is um, a professor uh, at McGill University, which is my alma mater. He studies neuropathic pain, which is a condition that it overwhelmingly affects women. And interestingly enough, the animal models of pain, neuropathic pain, the vast majority of labs use male mice. So male mice for a disease that affects women. And Jeff Mogil has been leading his own personal crusade against this and advocating for the use of male and female in every experiment, which is also what we do at Women's Brain Project. Uh, and I think um, this specific paper that I'm showing you here really made the point very clear. So what, what in this paper, what they were able to show, and it was published in Nature, is that you have a model where you induce neuropathic pain in rats, male and females. Then you measure the withdrawal threshold. This is a behavioral test where you, you measure how much weight they can hold on a paw, which is painful. So the, the paw is painful, it's, uh, it has pain. Uh, so of course, the, the, the lower 
the, the threshold, it means the lower they can stand, they can hold, uh, so the more pain they have. And what they were able to show in this paper is that uh, female and, and male rats developed um, pain in this model with very similar phenotypes, so they had same levels of pain. However, when you treated them with a drug called minocycline, which is an antibiotic with anti-inflammatory, especially microglia action, this drug was extremely effective in uh, male mice, but it was absolutely useless in female mice. And so this tells you a lot of things. In the rest of the paper, they actually clarify the mechanism and they were able to, to, um, to explain that neuropathic pain in the female mice, uh, so let's say neuropathic pain in the male mice is mediated by microglial cells. And so they respond to a, a drug that acts on microglia, while in the female mice, microglia don't seem to be playing such a big role and it seems to be more into the T cells. And they, now they're running additional experiments to figure out what is the cell population. So here you have a condition that has the same phenotype, but the mechanism, the biological mechanism in males and females is different, meaning if you pull all the data, you, buy, you might be missing the minocycline might have an effect. Uh, and when you separate them, you might come up with specific targets for males and females. So just to, to give you, you know, the, uh, just an, a glimpse into um, my thinking of how important this can be. Before I continue, I would like to highlight that I'm here today representing a larger group of uh, researchers and, and scientists, patients, uh, caregivers. We have journalists, we have experts in communication in ethics. It's a large group of people called Women's Brain Project. This is a non-profit organization founded in Switzerland in 2016, but acting globally. Uh, and our goal uh, is to really understand sex and gender determinants, in particular in brain and mental health. This is really what we care about because we think not enough is done there. Um, and here I'm showing you the, the beautiful faces of my collaborators, so I would like to thank them here. And what we are trying to do is understand sex and gender determinants for brain and mental health and the way the, our approach, it's 360 degrees. Um, so we try and cover all the different aspects that can play a role, starting from basic science, as I just show you these experiments in neuropathic pain, for instance, using animal models, moving into clinical science, drug development and clinical trials in particular important. We will be talking about this today. Never forgetting the importance of gender and the social determinants of health, because health is not just biology, but there's a lot that comes from the society and the economy. And finally, we are trying to promote a discussion into the importance of the sex and gender differences, also in novel technologies and artificial intelligence and the way we are using, we are building these novel tools for digital health using huge data sets and predictive algorithm. We think it's important to have a discussion on how the, the development of these technologies um, very often is gender biased, it's mostly men that do this, and the data sets that are used is, are biased in terms of uh, gender and ethnicity very often. So we are trying to elicit a discussion also uh, on this for the novel technologies. As Merce has said, I just want to this very quickly say that uh, we are quite present in social media, interviewed by journalists, and uh, we have quite a few publications. And for me, um, as the chief scientific officer, this is my goal. So my dream after the seminar today would be to have convinced at least one or two of you to actually do some research specifically into this. And, and let's see if at the end of the webinar, I will have uh, a little bit of feedback because we, we publish our own research, but also we collaborate with a lot of researchers worldwide um, to promote um, projects that specifically look into uh, sex and gender differences. And another thing that we do very, very often, we are invited to organize uh, events, uh, workshops and symposia. And here I'm showing you a roundtable that we organized for CITAD, the clinical trial uh, meeting in San Diego last year. This was a roundtable on sex and gender considerations in Alzheimer's disease and clinical trials. And it was my absolute pleasure to organize this in collaboration with uh, Fundacio Ate and uh, Merce Boada, who you can see here, and we had a beautiful panel with Cassandra Zoike from University of Melbourne, uh, Dr. Zimmer from Eli Lilly, uh, Rachel Dudi from, uh, from Roche. So it was, uh, I have to say, a very nice and very well received um, mm -hmm. session on this type of considerations in Alzheimer, which is a huge topic that I'm happy to, um, to cover in another occasion. 
but just to say, we I, I have also presented for the IDPD virtually, and I think you can still listen to the presentation in case you were interested. And I will be presenting also at the EAN, the European Academy of Neurology. And I encourage all of you to participate because it's going to be free. I don't know if you if you heard it, but um, there is no registration fee. So this is end of May. So let's go back to sex differences and let's start talking about COVID. So where are we with COVID here in this scheme that I presented you? Of course, uh, it does not happen to people only of one sex. And also there is no evidence to say that it happens only in people or more frequently in people of one sex. It is one of those conditions that present differently in people of one sex. And I would like to walk you through the evidence that we have for this. I would like to show you some data on the epidemiology and here I really mean uh, number of cases and deaths and then some additional data on symptoms. Uh, so disease severity and symptoms because I think they're both relevant. In terms of um, really numbers of cases and deaths, the very first evidence came from China and I'm very grateful for doctor, to Dr. Evelina Biskup from uh, also from Women's Brain Project who actually traveled to, to China um, to actually report um, on, on what was happening there and she immediately shared with us the data as they were coming and here we are showing you uh, the data presented in the first uh, the first report and first and only report from the CDC uh, Chinese author authorities which clearly showed that almost two thirds of deaths um, that the cases were 50 50 kind of between men and women but the deaths were two thirds in men with a higher case fatality rate uh, in men than women. So this was really the very first piece of evidence, but it was only China. Nobody knew whether this would hold on. And I have to say we haven't had an update since then from China. But the virus spread to other countries, so I'm going to show you some data from Italy because I've been following uh, the, the Italian data as they were published and almost immediately the data have been stratified by sex. Uh, what I'm showing you here is very similar picture to China, so 50-50 in terms of cases, but um, a prevalence of male deaths over uh, women is something that oscillates, it's between 60 and 70 percent, it's always in between, changes by, the we by week. Um, and this is the same data but broken down by age. Just to highlight that the, the previous data kind of give you the general idea, but when you look at the data broken by age, you really see that there are age brackets, especially here and here, where the number of men dying, these are deaths, so the number of men dying of the disease is more than double, sometimes three times uh, that of women. And there is an inversion only in the oldest old. So it's a very strong trend. And it's a trend that has been confirmed in other data sets and I would like to show you some Spanish data which I, I think you're all familiar with but it might be good to have them summarized here. And here I would like to thank Dr. Florencia Yulita who's also a member of the Women's Brain Project. She's an Argentinian but now based in Barcelona like you uh, and she helped me going through the, the Spanish report and extracting the important information. And what you can see that in Spain, like in China and like in Italy, the cases, uh, there is no clear prevalence of men or women, it's slightly more women, but uh, really not much. Uh, however, the deaths are clearly um, affecting more men than women. And I could go on and on and um, there is no point, but I would like to tell you if you're interested in this type of numbers, there is a website called Global Health 5050, uh, which keeps track of the of these statistics live. So you can actually go and check and it tells you which countries provide sex stratified data and it gives you the, the statistics that are available. So you will see that a lot of countries do not show sex stratified data uh, like Brazil and US. Uh, we do not have this information, but the ones that do show this information, the trend and here I'm showing you again the percentage of deaths is always the same with the exceptional situation of Thailand where I'm not sure what's happening, why the percentage is so high, but on average it's something around 70% of deaths men. Now this is numbers, the cases and the deaths. Even uh, as an additional information that I would like to share with you, um, some additional data, stratified data that might help us having a, a picture. Here I'm showing you the comorbidities that have been observed in the deaths. So the people who died of COVID, we have um, some data to indicate what were the most common comorbidities associated with death. And this data has been stratified by sex. 
in the Italian cohort, what we are seeing down here is that actually we cannot really say that men were more sick than women in general. They didn't have more comorbidities than women overall. But we do have a sex specific distribution of comorbidities. So the, the comorbidities are not all the same in men and women. For instance, in men, we have a higher percentage of ischemic heart disease, while in women we have more heart failure, which is actually pretty well known. I think very interestingly, uh, in, the, in this Italian cohort, hypertension was not more frequent in men, as you would expect, but actually was more frequent in women. And of course, dementia is also more frequent in women. I'm not sure if this is a risk factor, but still, it's a fact that a lot of female demented patients uh, had uh, COVID. And autoimmune diseases were more common in, uh, in women. For men, it's really the, the ischemic heart disease that stood, uh, stands out, the end uh, number of uh, respiratory issues, in particular COPD, and chronic liver and renal uh, failure. So I think that looking into this data, we can really start uh, understanding what are the comorbidities, what is the role of these comorbidities, especially those that are more common in men, and why are they then leading to, uh, to death in men. These are the same data, uh, type of data, but from the Spanish cohort, and the data are a little bit different. I'm showing them to you also to highlight the complexity of this topic. Let's say that Spanish men are not as healthy as Italian men, and then if you want, we can have, we can start a, a whole discussion on this, um, like pasta versus paella type of thing. <laughs> but um, what 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 it's coming out of this data set is that men overall were definitely uh, less healthy than women, so they had more comorbidities, and uh, this applied to cardiovascular comorbidities, respiratory comorbidities, and diabetes. Interestingly, hypertension. If you see the percentage here, is 17% uh, women and 18 in in men. So yes. It's a little bit more common in men, but it's a difference that is very tiny. So if I had to bet money, I would not bet on hypertension in being a factor that is leading these differences. But again, happy to discuss this with you. Um, I have to say the, Itali the, um, the Spanish data that is uh, published, I, I have the informer here, the, um, the reference, is very detailed and a lot more information than the, in, in the Italian one. So I'm happy to, to show you a little bit more data. Uh, for instance, there is a, a breakdown of symptoms by sex. And what one learns by checking this, this table is that the most common symptoms that you associate with COVID, so the fever and the respiratory symptoms, uh, so here the dyspnea, uh, pneumonia, um, and, and respiratory symptoms, are more frequent and much higher percentage in men. And interestingly, in women, you have a higher percentage of less common symptoms like sore throat, uh, vomit, uh, yeah, <laughs> now I'm mixing the Spanish with, uh, uh, with English, uh, but the gastrointestinal um, symptoms, which we know that also sometimes occur in COVID, but they're not so common and they might be um, a, a typical presentation of, uh, of women. I think this is a very interesting topic to, to further explore. Finally, um, we have also information on the, let's say, disease severity of cases. As you can see, the vast majority of the people who were not hospitalized, so they were deemed less severe, were women. The ones hospitalized, vast majority were men. And the ones that ended up, unfortunately, in the intensive care unit, again, mostly men. So there is a clear indication in the Spanish uh, data and anecdotally, basically everywhere, that uh, the most severe cases are men. So to summarize this first part of the um, data that I show you, I, I, could, I would say that in COVID we have some very interesting sex differences that are emerging. Uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be that the infection um, is, is different between men and women. So men and women can get it with the same frequency, but it's the way they respond to it in terms of severity of the disease and in terms of mortality. And this uh, is holding on in different states. So I think it's pointing out to something very strong, and I would say something biological, but of course we could also discuss uh, gender factors. Um, the issue of sex-specific symptoms is, of course, very early days. I just want to throw it out there because it's one of those aspects that are very relevant in gender medicine in general. And one of there was a huge case for stroke, saying that since stroke does not present the same way in, in women, we have a number of women who are misdiagnosed and, and mistreat, not properly treated in the, in the hospitals because of that. What if we were missing cases or delaying diagnosis of COVID in women for the same reason? Just you know, food for thought. 
And finally, the role of comorbidities. This is something that uh, I think it's super interesting and fascinating and incredible topic for uh, clinical research. Um, we have comorbidities that are more often seen in, uh, in men in different data sets, and I would really like to, to dig a little bit you know, deeper and understand uh, what could be the role of comorbidities and why certain comorbidities, especially the cardiovascular level, make men uh, more vulnerable to this um, respiratory uh, virus. So that was my first, uh, let's say, block, and I will stop here. Um, I have, the, yeah, I have this slide for question and comments and asking you whether you're still there. I hope so. So uh, I'm not sure what is the best way, but if um, Isabel and Carmen are there, uh, maybe we can see if some questions were asked from the audience already or what would be the best way to go about this. Well, I am here, um, but I think we need to congratulate you, Dr. Ferretti, because uh, no one has asked nothing till now, so you must have been very, very clear. Oh, so I, I think we can us. go on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I really encourage you to, to write some comments uh, to, to make this a little bit um, interactive and also because I might be, there are certain things that might be very clear in my mind and maybe are not or I'm forgetting to, to touch on. So. Um, I welcome very much uh, comments uh, from you. Yes, uh, every attendant to this webinar can ask questions uh, through the chat. Uh, on the right up corner of the screen, you will see an icon of a question, and then you can click here and write down your questions. We encourage you to participate as long as you want. As well, if uh, Marcel Boada has comments here, I'm, I'm also happy to. <laughs> or uh, no. all clear. <laughs> Mer Merci Boada have not comments because okay. I, I know your presentation previously. I know. And uh, what is one of my interests that you share with us all this information? Because sometimes information that we receive even from the, the newspaper, the journals, mm -hmm. or for the academic papers, they are not emphasizing the difference from the sex. And, and that is interesting in order to understand the, the, one of the, the, the very crucial, the, the pinpoint here is the death. How, mm -hmm. how it's men have a major ratio of this than women, who is protected, how, how it's protect women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order that they are a, a good survivors, no, or the best survivor from the COVID. And that is a question in order, not for this time, because this time is only we need to collect data, but so. we need to understand this data in order to prevent the next time. Exactly. And that is a, a big opportunity. It's a fantastic opportunity to understand or to or to fix our point of view, not only in the global numbers, but in the different numbers. Yeah. One this of is, each. Uh, and no, other, so, yeah. And this, you know, once we do this exercise for COVID, then I think we should start thinking in the same way for every disease. That's my hope to to bring, yeah. you know, to make the case for the importance of this in, in every disease. Uh, Dr. Okay. Red, we have two questions. Yes. Um, Emilio, uh, Emilio is asking, uh, is saying thank you for the introduction regarding the difference between sex and gender. I would like to know how you work in this field with the LGBT community. Uh, I know. Um, I, I, um, I, first of all, thank for this question because it's a crucial one. And every time I try a little bit to address it and I know that I'm not doing a good job, so I apologize. Uh, because we, it's very easy, I'm a basic researcher, so for me it's very easy to, to work with sex differences and just dichotomize and say, you know, female and, ma uh, and males, and that's easy. But when we go into human uh, patients, it, it's not so easy because you have gender and gender is complex, as I tried to, to mention. and it's 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 so complex that we actually do not have a lot of information specifically for specific groups uh, but there is also a huge opportunity because you have the transgender you have different scenarios where you could really dissect the role of biology and hormones and and so hormones from uh, um, uh, from the genetics and then gender so 
the, what I'm saying here is that we know very little. This is something that we know we should do more and it's in our to do list to advocate for this as well. And that I personally see it as a very complex issue, but at the same time is an opportunity to understand much more um, the complexity of, uh, of the disease and how this sex and gender interact. So stay tuned because I really hope in the future we will have a bit uh, more on this. It, and for COVID, I'm not aware of any uh, data that came out on these specific communities, but if I hear about this, I will share it with you for sure. Uh, then Esther is asking, thank you for the presentation. What do you think is the mechanism involved in these sex differences, biologically speaking? Yeah, so I have in the in the final part of the presentation, I will go through a, at least a couple. Uh, but just to give you a preview, um, biologically, I think there are two main uh, factors. One is the, the immune system, the regulation of the immune system, and this is something really driven by um, genetic expression, uh, so X-linked genes, as well as hormones, so that's one thing. And the other aspect that we will discuss more later as well is uh, the receptor, ACE2 receptor. Uh, which is the, the, the receptor that the virus uses to enter the cells. And there is some evidence for this receptor being differentially expressed in men and women. Again, it's expressed on the X chromosome. So that's another potential line uh, and an explanation. And it's still sex uh, differences and it's still biology, but much more into clinical research, these comorbidities. I think uh, there is much more to understand from, I'm 100% sure it's something with the vascular system, but I, 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 we don't know enough right now, but this would be a third line that I would uh, pursue of research. But thank you for the, the question. We will, I hope we will have more discussion than in the second block on this. Then there's another question, yes. uh, which would be, are there data um, about loss of smell and taste, whether it refers by sex and gender? Yeah, great, great question. I comment on this later on because actually not that I've seen. I might have missed it, but I haven't found a lot, even this um, this uh, anosmia, I think is the term. So the loss of smell is not even reported as in this list of most common symptoms that I show you um, from the Spanish report, for instance, it's not listed there. Uh, and I, I haven't seen any data stratified by sex, but I, I would be very curious to see about that. So I'm on the lookout. Again, if I hear something, I will share it with you. OK, then there's another question uh, that says, hi, thank you so much. It's very interesting. I have a question. Do you think that the COVID crisis will raise interest in and boost gender sex differentiated scientific research? And that's why I'm here. <laughs> I really hope so. I really, really hope so that we can make the case. Um, and I would I, I would really welcome any comment and feedback from you because and we can have this discussion um, now or later because I really think everybody looks at these differences and you, you see them, they are there, but then what we are missing is the so what? So what's the point of all this? Is it really relevant? So I will try and show you why I think it's relevant, but I for me it would be gold if you could give me some feedback and, and tell me what do you think? What could be really interesting and uh, appealing to move forward? You know, we have these differences, but then why are they important and how could we really use them to, to improve uh, medicine? I, I definitely have my ideas and I want to share them uh, with you, but uh, I'm curious to see what is your uh, reaction, you know, to make a stronger case and also to identify potential caveats uh, as well. So um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to discuss. Okay. Oh, also our, our participants, because you have another question again. And <laughs> I think there's three more questions. Is there any, any information related to antecedents of smoking and fatality of COVID-19 uh, disease and stratification of smoking or previous smoking by sex? Yeah, again, so this the smoking part always comes up as a gender related issue for um, uh, for explaining the, the higher mortality in men. It's kind of intuitive that smoke would be linked to, to higher risk of death. However, I haven't seen very strong, strong data to show that. Uh, in the Italian community, there is even some, again, anecdotal reports of smokers, of COVID patients and deaths being actually even less smokers than in the general population. So this smoking thing, I'm not 100% sure, but I haven't seen, so in general for COVID and even more so, I haven't seen a stratification by sex. What I can tell you is in Italy, I know the data for, for Italy, uh, it is true that men smoke more often than women overall, the, the overall statistics. However, it really, it's different by age group. 
and it, it's only strongly significant in the 65 plus, but in the middle age, it's the same percentage. And in the young people, the teenagers, it's more girls than boys that are smoking. So I think smoke could be a reason in countries like China, maybe, but I don't see this as a driving reason for uh, for Italy. But we are waiting to see the, the stratified data to, to say for sure. Yeah, that's a okay. very important point. Yeah. Okay, Excellent. thank you. Uh, the next question would be, uh, Dr. Bona Dr. Benake, based on your experience, could you point out which will be the scientific reasons underlying such differences, severity, mortality, symptoms? Yeah, so I, again, it's kind of a similar question to the previous one, and I, uh, with the, the, in the last part of the presentation, I will really deep dive into this. So. Uh, just uh, just a bit of patience. <laughs> OK, just then the, the next the final question for okay. this doc. Thank you for the presentation. Is the progression of COVID symptomatology faster in men than women? That's also a very good question. Um, I'm thinking what data I'm aware of. Again, the Italian report shows on average the timing from diagnosis to hospitalization and from hospitalization to death if death happens. And in those those data are not sex stratified, so I'm not aware of data that point to this, but it would be a very important um, aspect to to look into. Definitely, thank you for the question. We uh, we should take note and then ask the epidemiologists. Uh, you know, <laughs> really run all the <laughs> all, all these questions. Sure. Yeah, and you can oh. go on with the next block if you want because yes. we are over. Okay, yeah. great. But it was this was very nice. Thanks. To everybody who who posed questions, it's um, it's great. It's really great. So I have one block on COVID and gender, um, and it, this is um, it, it's again just to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, our thinking. Why at the Women's Spring Project we think uh, this gender aspect can be important. And here again, I apologize, but it's mostly into the thinking of men and, and women in the society. It doesn't really reflect much on the uh, on all the other uh, possible um, the, the spectrum, uh, but it's really to start the conversation to to get you thinking about how these factors can also be important. So talking about health uh, workers, the impact on families and in general mental health very quickly just to, to throw there that there is also this topic. And let me start from by numbers because this is very important for me. So I'm showing you here both the Italian and the Spanish numbers in terms of um, number of cases in the health uh, workers. So you remember we said in the general population you have 50-50 men and women. However, cases so infected people are not not dead, but infected people. First of all, in Italy, we have really it's a tragedy because we have more than 10 percent cases in the hospitals, which is a disaster, absolute disaster. And of these, um, 70 percent or almost 70 percent are, uh, are women. So vast majority are women and we are seeing something similar in Spain here. Actually, it's, it's even nicer. The study that has been done. So um, different exposure reasons have been analyzed by sex, how a person can come into contact um, with a virus, either because you are in contact with an infected person, with a person with acute respiratory illness. You work in a hospital, you are visiting a health center. And in all these cases is women that are affected with higher percentages than men. So what these numbers are telling you, I mean, it's really not surprising because we do know that um, healthcare workforce and here we are talking about both the paid, so really the workforce and the unpaid, the caregivers are mostly women. It's really two thirds up to 70 percent. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that even though women seem to be biologically protected on the consequences of the virus. It is true and we have to keep into consideration that they are really at the front line of this pandemic in terms of um, facing the, the virus, really having to work with people who are uh, sick with the virus, um, both in a, in a hospital, in a work environment and at home in the families because they are the caregivers. So this is something I think that we should not forget um, because I, I this might have implications. One aspect that we would like to highlight here is that uh, the pandemic has a has a tremendous toll, psychological toll on healthcare workers, and I'm, I'm sure you know very well what I'm talking about. Um, there was even uh, they, they just sent me here the the news of a doctor in New York who took her life because she was not able to cope with the stress and the trauma of all these cases. And in Italy, we had similar situations, really extreme. So. The workforce, which is mostly women, are exposed to um, very high uh, levels of me uh, mental and emotional stress as well as trauma. 
ethical dilemmas. I'm sure you know the issue of respirators, whom to save, old people, young people. I mean, um, I, I, I wouldn't know what to do either. Um, very intense working conditions, incredible shifts that they are doing and with a uh, protective gear. Lack of supplies in Italy, this is again a tragedy. It's getting a little bit better, but again, um, we have such a high um, number of infected cases in the hospitals because it's uh, there is really lack of proper protection, unfortunately. And again, this is impacting more women than, than men just by numbers. And then here I, I highlighted the childcare in time of quarantine. So one issue that we had in Italy, and I think you have similar situation in Spain, is that the workforce, the, the individuals who work in the hospitals, doctors and nurses, um, do not have the possibility to have childcare offered to them as opposed to Austria, for instance. I'm calling you from Austria right now in Vienna. And here, if I was a doctor or a nurse, I would have a kindergarten that is open to send my child there. So in, in specific cases, the childcare is provided. And I think that that's very important. In Italy, in Spain, I think in Spain as well, this is not offered. The result is that uh, children of nurses and doctors who are potentially exposed to the virus because they just go back home at the end of the day to their families, these children are taken care of by the grandparents. You sh in theory, you shouldn't do it, but in the end, that's what's happening. And the lack of childcare and the issues in finding childcare, it's again an issue that um, falls mostly on, uh, on women who have to find a way. Um, and this kind of leads me to the next topic, which is related, very much related to gender uh, equality. Um, and I, I, the, I think the best way to frame it is this tweet from uh, uh, Sam Gilles, who said the next person who tweets about how productive Isaac Newton was while working from home gets my three year old posted to them. Because it is true that for many people that this quarantine time is uh, extended time at home and, and uh, for some people this means having more time to work, read, write and so on. But it is also true that we have our children with us in most cases and uh, this means that you can't possibly be as productive, uh, as, productive as, as uh, Isaac Newton. There is really no way. And because of gender dynamics in, in almost every family, vast majority of families. If, me, if uh, mom and dad are both at home and you have one or two children, it will be the mother that will take care of the children most of the time, it, you know, with different variations, but the, the, in, in any case, the burden will be higher on women. So right now there is quite a lot of concern in, um, in, in the, let's say, in this, uh, in this space thinking about women and I'm, I'm very, of course, I'm very sensitive to the topic of women in science and researchers because this is where you, you would like to write your papers, right? And to submit and submit them and so on. And there have been anecdotal um, reports that women are not submitting as many papers as they used to do in the past. And it might be due to the fact that they simply have no time. So that would be a pity really. And uh, for similar, a similar um, point here is the situation again of Italy, and I'm not sure, but it might be the same in Spain, that everything is opening again in the phase two, but kindergarten and schools. So again, we don't know what to do with their children. Parents have to work and children simply don't have a place. So again, I'm not saying that in every family, but in many families will be the woman who will just give up and uh, stay with the children at home, which would be going back of decades in terms of the conquest that we have done in terms of equity and equality in the workplace. Uh, this is again just a dimension that I want to give you just to tell you that there is also this happening in, in terms of sex and gender differences, which should also keep in mind that we have this impact of, of a pandemic on diff which, is, which is different between men and women. And finally, the psychological impact. Uh, this is, of course, a tremendous impact and, the, and, and I don't want to um, underestimate. I actually want to say it very clear that this is an incredible burden on both men and women. Um, I'm not saying that men are immune to this, not at all, uh, but the, there might be differences in the, in the way this burden is experienced and the results. So you have a lot of psychological stress due to the fear of loss of income, employment or having, it, having lost it, uh, the isolation, the boredom, the fear of infection, uh, inadequate information, so anxiety, domestic abuse is a, it's a huge topic. This can happen to both men and women, but it will happen with different um, frequencies and with different results. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that women tend to suffer more than men of uh, anxiety and depression. Two thirds of patients are women normally, so they 
kind of have a higher risk to begin with. So when you put an extra stressor on them, you would expect more women than men. Given the same situation, you would expect more women than men to develop depression and, and anxiety. On the other hand, men tend to do um, to go for substance abuse, for instance, self-medication and substance abuse. So you might expect an increase in alcohol abuse or drug abuse because of the pandemic. And again, this type of considerations to be aware that men and women, they are both at risk, but for different diseases and they might need different types of interventions might help us supporting them. The summary of this gender part, which is very superficial, but again, it was just to give you an idea, is that even though women are biologically protected, we do have to remember that they are more exposed to the infection, to coming into contact with the virus uh, because of their gender roles um, as, as caregivers uh, and as uh, work uh, health uh, healthcare workforce. Then we have the issue of the pandemic and especially the family dynamics um, on the career and gender equity for women. And finally, we, have, we should consider very seriously the impact on mental health and how we might need to support men and women differently. And this was for gender. And now the final part of my presentation, uh, I would like to move on and really um, try and discuss with you what I think could be the lessons for the future. So something that we have learned from COVID that we could also take with us and, uh, and expand uh, to improve the way we are dealing with COVID, but then as, as Merce Boada said, um, also for the next pandemics and for other diseases as well. What, what is in there that we can learn that is uh, interesting? And I would like to go through uh, at least three points. One is research, general research, the clinical trials, and in general, the patient management. And why I would like to do this, just very quickly, I would like to tell you that we had this webinar uh, on the 16th of April where we, we show very quickly the sex differences. Um, Marce Boada participated and uh, gave a great input and uh, we had very nice questions from the audience, very engaged audience, and we kept receiving questions also in the days after. And I, I, I've been reading them and one of them really caught my attention. You know, it's um, uh, I, I thought it was the question that we had to answer. And the question was, th th this uh, it was actually a guy, he said, I'm not really sure what's the big question here. You know, I'm not a scientist, but you know, males tend to die younger because of lifestyle. So really Really I'm wondering if we're not dealing with a marginal issue here rather than more interesting issues. And then he went on explaining the, the issues that he was mostly concerned about. And, you know, I think this is a crucial question and uh, I think we should really address it. Uh, of course, my position, I'm a little bit biased here, uh, here and I'm going to tell you that this is not a marginal issue. I'm not also saying that it's the issue, but it's one issue that one should consider and at least be aware of. But in the next couple of slides, I try to put together a number of um, points where I think that knowing, being aware of the sex differences can really help in the way we do research, clinical trials and manage patients. So for research, um, there have been this um, the immune system, the ACE2 uh, and the, the microvascular uh, topics that, as I was telling you, these are the most um, um, right now, the, the most quoted, let's say, explanations for, for, uh, for the reason for having this difference in mortality between men and women. So let's just go into them one by one very quickly, and I'm happy to, to address questions on this. First of all, the immune system, which is my favorite. I mean, this is, uh, if again, if I had to bet money, I, I would uh, bet a significant amount on this one because we all know that the immune system is regulated differently between men and women. This is also known to change with age. Um, in reality, there aren't, um, there are a lot of things that are not well characterized. And right now here, I'm showing you a paper that came out at the beginning of this year in Nature, um, where the authors used a variety of techniques to characterize a number of uh, immune indicators, let's say markers, in men and women at young, middle age and older age. And here you have the age reference. And the take home message of this paper was that things change. change. So things are different between men and women and they change with age. And what caught my attention and I think might be relevant for COVID is that, uh, especially in the older group, which is unfortunately the one that is dying more often of, uh, of the disease, um, you have in men um, a, a lower expression of markers that are related to the activity of the adaptive immune system, in particular T cells and B cells, while there is an upregulation of markers that are related to a cytotoxic response. And also, if you can see here, these are um, 
levels, uh, really cytokine levels in blood of interleukin-6 and interleukin-18, again higher uh, in, uh, in men than, uh, than women. So the, the, the proposed mechanism or the proposed take, um, explanation that uh, the authors gave in this paper was that it, it, it might be that in older age, uh, women are still have a, an adaptive system that is still very uh, efficient. However, this is not so efficient in men. And so you have the innate immune system that goes into overdrive. This is, in my opinion, a very interesting hypothesis to study. Uh, it, nothing is for sure right now, but it's an hypothesis that one could really explore in, in research. I'm not aware of studies that look at, for instance, interleukin-6 levels in blood of COVID male and female patients, which might be interesting to look at. We also don't know how these different immune mediators develop over time. We don't know. This was a very important question that uh, Dr. Boada asked during the webinar. We don't know how the immune response builds up, you know, with from the very first innate response and then the build up of the adaptive response, the IgG, the IgM, all this um, in terms of timing and the intensity between men and women to this specific virus. This is not known and it might teach us something in the way the virus is working. Um, as well, I would be super interested in seeing if the inflammation that you have uh, and the tissue damage that you have due to inflammation in men and women in lungs and in other tissues, of course, brain, brain as well, is different. And again, I'm not aware of studies that have uh, looked into, into this. And I know it's very difficult to do autoptic studies right now with COVID, but it would be in my research uh, agenda for the future for sure. So that's for the immune system. Then quickly about the ACE receptor, the angiotensin um, converting enzyme 2. This is the port of entry of this virus into the cells and it was the same for MERS and SARS, other two coronaviruses. And very interestingly, also MERS and SARS had a male bias. So this led a lot of people to think that there might be something here with the ACE receptor. Um, what is crucial to know is that actually this gene is expressed on the X chromosome. So you have the whole issue that if you want, we can discuss a little bit more at length of uh, X inactivation. So um, women have basically two copies of this gene and they might be protected in case you have, uh, you inherit um, a variant that is for some reason more permissive to pathology. Women might be protected because they have a second uh, copy according to the inactivation, uh, uh, the random inactivation. Then it turns out that actually this gene escapes X inactivation. So it's even more common. So you would think, OK, ACE2 is more com more uh, expressed at higher level in women and it's not the case either. It's one of those rare cases where escapes X inactivation, but it's still higher in men than women. Uh, so it's a bit of a puzzle, this gene, to be honest with you. Uh, it's also to further complicate things. There are quite a few studies showing that the expression and the activity of this receptor are modulated by uh, sexual hormones. Um, further indicating that it, it might function differently between men and women, but there are really so many things that are not known. So again, I think this is an opportunity for us to learn. So I would like to have very robust studies to look into the expression and the activity of this uh, virus in the patients, because we have some studies looking into repositories of uh, many samples from general population, but I think we need to look at the specifically at the patient uh, samples and also looking at specific common variants and how this could be permissive for uh, more pathology and there might be different between men and women. We have a few papers that are starting to appear on this, but they are mostly preprint from what I've seen. So I'm cautious here because we I would like to have them peer reviewed and then um, at the next webinar, I will present you also the, the updated information. But it's I think it's an incredible chance to understand how the, the, this whole thing works, uh, basically at the res research level. And a little bit more clinical, I would like to highlight the, the microvessel uh, part. So what has been, we were just discussing this also um, the last time, that there is, this, this virus is of course a respiratory virus, but there is a, a, a vascular component of, of the pathology. And uh, um, it has been noted that there is mimicry of vasculitis, there is, there are signs of hypercoagulation, patients have very high D-dimer levels, Thrombosis is a huge thing. Right now in Italy, we are testing uh, antithrombotic uh, therapy for uh, for COVID and many doctors swear by it that it's the solution to the problem. 
pulmonary embolism is very common. So we now know there was a beautiful paper. I hope you had a chance to open it in the Lancet from uh, Varga et al. Uh, who uh, show um, in a very clear way that you have a vir viral uh, virus, which are these round particles that you see here, invading um, also endothelial cells in the, uh, this was taken in the kidney, I think. So the endothelium itself can be attacked by the virus. So that could be, you know, an alternative way that um, kind of an alternative pathway for the virus. We might have micro vessel damage. And there, are, there is at least one paper suggesting that you have, as a consequence, thrombosis, which is induced by complement. And I would like to highlight here that a number of thrombotic disorders are more common in men than women. So again, this might be an explanation more at the clinical level. But as you might appreciate from my presentation, there are a lot of things that are really not clear, and I think they're really a huge opportunity for research. Uh, for instance, I'm not aware of studies that look at the D dimer levels in men and women and whether their prognostic um, value uh, is different uh, in, uh, in men and women patients. I'm also not sure if endothelial damage, it, it might be different between men and women. You know, it might be an explanation that endothelium from, for men is more vulnerable to this type of attack. We don't know, but it could be very interesting to look at. Uh, so in, in terms of um, understanding the clinical evolution of the disease, potential biomarkers, uh, as well as uh, really finding also pharmacological targets. So this leads me to the, to the clinical trial part. And I have three slides to tell you my thinking of why I think uh, when we understand better sex and gender differences, we can really improve our clinical trial design. This applies to COVID, but it's a general concept, in my opinion, that we can extrapolate and apply it to any other disease. And of course, I have Alzheimer very close to my mind. So um, just keep in mind that this is very general. But let's stick to COVID for, for simplicity. Let's say you think this is how the disease progresses, right? Um, and I took this from a very nice uh, review in, uh, in Nature. So you identify a number of targets and you identify a number of drugs that could act on these targets. But if you realize that a number that quite a lot of these targets actually are regulated in a different way between men and women, the expression are dif levels are different, the activity is different. Um, we are talking about ACE2, but we could be talking about interleukin-6 as a, as a therapeutic target, which is actually one clinical trial, which is ongoing, um, would be down here, or complement. If you realize that you have sex and gender differences in the targets, then shouldn't you adjust your clinical trial design to that, or at least uh, make sure that you are checking for sex and gender uh, differences? Because my fear is that if, you, if this is not in your, um, in your radar, you, you will not look specifically into the sex and gender differences. You will pull all the data all together and then you might miss a signal that might happen in, in one sex rather than the other. So, you know, I, I hope by now people have understood the, this concept, but I have to tell you that many in many cases, um, I come across many cases where this factor was not really properly considered in, uh, in clinical trials. And I, I think um, this has a lot of, again, of opportunities, even because you might identify a, clinic, uh, a target, a pharmacological target, which is specific for one sex. Let's say you figure out there is a receptor in the endothelium which is overexpressed by men and not women. You could design a drug specifically for men. And I, I frankly, I think that would be a huge success. You could have sex specific treatments, which you might, you might completely miss if you don't appreciate the sex differences. So that's one thing. Another thing is that we might learn from the sex and gender differences in terms of what is protective. Uh, and this is also uh, what the Dr. Boada was mentioning. And I'm, I'm just showing you uh, here that this has started already. So the hypothesis here is that maybe women are protected because of action of estrogen. Then if that's true, if you administer estrogen to patients, you should be able to reduce severity and possibly mortality of the virus. And this hypothesis has been, is currently tested in two clinical trials in the States. There is a lot of controversy around the use of estrogen, and I'm happy to, to talk about it in a discussion. But uh, this, is, this is happening, and again, it would not happen if we hadn't noticed this difference between men and women. So it, it widens and opens up the possibilities of things that we can test. And finally, um, a comment to how the sex differences, we might really exploit them for improving or refining treatments. And here I'm mentioning the, um, the example of the plasma of donors of immune people. So people who, who have passed the infection, survived it, and they are immune. 
and I'm sure you know very well, there are several clinical trials that are collecting the plasma of donors and testing whether this can be used for, I don't think, prevention, but uh, treatment of, uh, of patients. Um, now, let's say that plasma for women has a lot more antibodies than plasma from men, which at the moment we don't know. So first of all, we should do that research and, and clarify it. But in general, women mount a much stronger antibody response to vaccination and uh, in, in other diseases. So I would expect that, to be honest. Let's say that's true, then maybe you might want to have specific cocktails of this plasma um, samples uh, that contain maybe more uh, women material because that might be more efficient, you know, or at least you, you might want to check in your clinical trial if that made a difference. So even the sex and gender differences, we might find a way to exploit them to, to come up with solutions and to something that works even better. And for the plasma, there is also a, a safety concern that I would like to mention, which is also something we should consider because, for instance, in Italy, um, plasma, uh, it's not accepted the donation of plasma from women because there have been cases, uh, there is a very high risk, uh, especially for uh, multiparous uh, women, of then inducing in the recipient um, a very strong uh, respiratory uh, and lung infection, and resp immune response. So even that might be important to know if it also safety concerns of every treatment, whether it makes a difference for, for men and women. So always keeping this in your radar, always keeping it in your mind for clinical trials design. And the final point that I wanted to mention, it's a little bit more clinical and um, just very general points uh, that have been brought up by several clinicians that I collaborate with. Um, and it applies to COVID, but it, it applies a lot to Alzheimer's as well and to any other um, disease. If you know, if you, if you study and you document and you have solid data uh, about sex and gender differences in risk factors, for instance, and in progression of the disease, then you can adjust uh, your risk assessment and your prognosis stratification also based on sex. And I'm not saying that sex is the only thing, but you should have it there. You should consider it to, to be able to provide the best treatment to the patient. Uh, and this is the same for um, for preventative uh, measures, which might be different for men and women. If we identify maybe smoke as a specific risk factor for men, then we should direct a, a specifically to them a campaign against smoke. Um, then the issue of recognizing specific symptoms. And um, here is what we were mentioning before. We still don't know. I would like to see the data, but it might be that the presentation of the disease is different in men and women, and this might lead to a late diagnosis in, in one versus the other. So that's also something to keep in mind. And finally, um, a mention to neurological symptoms and follow up, and this is very close to my heart. So neurological symptoms, as you know, there is a neurological component of COVID that is emerging. Um, there are very few reports right now, but we know that this is happening. There are neurological symptoms, so this virus is attacking also the, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. It would be incredibly interesting to check whether these symptoms are different in men and women, because based on our work in the, with the Women's Brain Project, we know that basically every brain disease that you can think about has a sex prevalent bias, let's say. Some are more common in men, some are common in women. It's very rare to have 50-50, so I would be very interested to see whether the neurological symptoms are different in men and women. And again, this would help you treat the patients better. And follow up, what do I mean with follow up? And this is something that I'm very worried about, is that we are right now focusing on the emergency on, of the pandemic right now, and we are treating the acute patients. And then we are um, sending the patients that are healthy again, that are cured, we are sending them at home. And then we don't know what will happen to them. So it's absolutely crucial to create registries to follow them. And I'm in, particularly cons in particular concerned with um, all these people who experienced the virus, they had this huge cytokine storm and immune re response. And then this could be a risk factor for a number of diseases later on, especially neurological diseases. And of course, I'm thinking about Alzheimer because there is an incredible link between systemic inflammation and Alzheimer. So what if all these women that are um, surviving COVID right now, in maybe 20 years, they will end up uh, having a, an Alzheimer pathology because this is a, we find out it's a risk factor for, uh, for Alzheimer. So I think the follow up of both men and women and keeping in mind that the long term consequences of this virus might be different for men and women as well. I think this is also crucial and uh, I, I really hope at the level of public health that this will be taken into consideration. So 
this this is my whole vision and I'm very curious to hear what you guys think about it. But the, the call to action and the, the take home message from my call is that um, we should really move on from a one size fits all medicine approach where we think everybody's the same and we give the same drug drug to everybody to consider that there are um, there is a heterogeneity in the patients and sex is one of the factors, of course, and it's not the only one. And what we advocate for is precision medicine. And actually what we are trying to do is to build an institute in Switzerland uh, to really um, promote research into this specific aspect to really improve uh, basic research as well as patient journey from diagnosis to treatment and in particular clinical trial design. So all the points that I've been mentioning to you, these are very close to our heart and we're actually working on them uh, to create a research institute that will focus on this to improve the way we, um, we do clinical trials and we manage uh, patients. So if you are interested in, in this type of project, if you're interested in precision medicine or in research projects, uh, papers, please reach out to me uh, because we would be very happy to, to collaborate. And this was my last slide. Then I have the, the questions and, uh, and comments again, the second round. So let's see if uh, we have a few more. And then I have a, a close one, a closing <laughs> thank, one. Thank you, thank <laughs> you very much, Maria Teresa, because to divide your talk in two different point of view and objective, offer a, a beautiful point of view about COVID because one is data, another is how how it's we know about the COVID and, and how it's the, the next steps to do. And the next steps to do, you are focusing in two things, um, specific clinical trials for uh, uh, males and females. Another is uh, 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 an, um, preventing medicine, a specific medicine for um, taking into account the sex difference. And the other is to follow these kind of patients that it was in contact or infected by the coronavirus to understand the new, the new phenotypes, the new neuropathology that it's appeared. As, as you mentioned, Alzheimer's disease is linked with neuroinflammation and immunology. And COVID, it's, it's a risk factor. Could be a new, could be, eh? could, could be, be. Yeah. be. Yeah. a new factors to yeah. develop fast or no to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease. And we need to follow all these patients in order that uh, cognitive decline, if the, the condition, it change the pattern, eh? the pattern in the, uh, to pass maybe from the my cognitive decline, my cognitive improvement to the dementia using one fast track. And this fast track may be one uh, COVID relationships with the COVID. We need to understand more and more and more and more the uh, lesions in the micro uh, basils in order to micro hemorrhage, micro bleeds, uh, micro thrombosis in order to appear another concept, no link to the neuroinflammation, link to the vascular and to promote, I don't know, eh? that is my brainstorming, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it could be thinking, also in the brain, yeah, yeah, yeah but could also be in, in the brain endothelium, we don't know. Yes, in, in yeah. to appear more vascular disease in Alzheimer's disease, or even in this population that it's exposed to the COVID. And uh, COVID offer a lot of opportunities to understand more and more the causality in Alzheimer's disease and, is, uh, and to understand more and more the, the sex difference. And one thing that is really, really interesting is to use to increase the level of hormones in mains in order to predict and prevent, I'm sorry. That is, that, that I follow you during all this talk because part of this talk is novel for me, is a novelty. And I was thinking how a lot of war we have from now to the next weeks, not next weeks, next, next months, because 2021 could be the past COVID pandemic, but it maybe could be the year that COVID will be present in a lot of the consequence of the, 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 the new pathology that appear in, uh, in this post-COVID period. 
That is my impression. And I want to thank Yuri for because it was a beautiful talk, very interesting no, and very informative and open the mind, open the mind to grow the mindset in order how to do in the post COVID period. And the micro and the questions is open to, to you for the audience. And thank you very much for, and I appreciate a lot that for your time and for share with you, with all of us, your knowledge. Thank you. Thank the you. time is, the micro is open. My pleasure. And if there are questions, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear them. I cannot read them, but I yes, yes, hear. there's a yes, there's a, there's a question. Uh, do you think that clinical trials should differentiate the inclusion and exclusion criteria for men and for women? Could be. That's that's yeah. another aspect. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, good. absolutely. Could be as well. But to be able to do that. So th what I keep telling people is that we need data. So if people don't do, re if we don't have the research, the basic research done into this epidemiology, then we don't have data to inform such a decision. But it might very well be that we need to adjust also the inclusion and exclusion. And I think uh, in the case of, um, uh, I mean, this is a very complex uh, issue, but we are collaborating with, um, with actually Dr. Boada on a project to really understand inclusion and exclusion criteria in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, it, it does appear that there are differences in, in the reasons for which people are excluded from a clinical trial. I don't want to say much because it's, it's really uh, Mercedes work, but it, it is an, an extremely important topic and nobody has looked into this. So I think um, it's, uh, it's very promising. In, in, it's very, very relevant. Yeah. Next question. There's no more questions for now. OK, <laughs> <laughs> so I so while people think about their questions, let, allow me to invite everybody to our next event. Um, every year we organize a flagship event, the International Forum on Women's Brain and Mental Health. Um, we had the, the pleasure and the honor of having uh, Dr. Boada with us last year, so she <laughs> can actually witness to uh, what a great thing it is. No, it's a lot of fun, I have to say. It's a, we, we had it live, of course, last year, which was a two day, extremely interactive panel discussions as short as possible and then a lot of discussion with the audience. Uh, this year we decided to keep it. Of course, we will not be able to have it live, but we are building a spectacular platform for online um, conference, not Zoom based, really it's something completely different, closer to TV show than uh, uh, than a Zoom webinar um, with the idea of keeping, keeping it extremely informative, extremely dynamic and extremely interactive as well with a lot, a lot of discussion. Um, so we are we are working on the websites and uh, I encourage you to, to check um, regularly our website because very soon we will open the, the registrations and I really hope many of you will uh, will join us for the discussion. Um, and yeah, my final slide is this one with a thank you, but I, I'm still hoping that there will be a couple of questions more so maybe we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Um, for yes, they are. At, mm, sorry, sorry, Dr. Bada, go on please. No, no, and thank you for the invitation back. As, I, I, as you know, your webinars always, it's really extremely interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and no, no, and the format, it was very interesting because you share uh, journalists, scientists, persons in the TV, uh, good speakers, uh, like, like uh, 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 very good tech talkers in order yep. to give very easy information, very easy that very, very complex information. But I, I take uh, your offering in advantage in order that you are invited in the next Barcelona Pittsburgh that we are moving to the 2021. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and gender have a prominent position in order that understand a little more and to provoke more interest in, uh, in this topic. And maybe you are the star. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Keep me posted. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, then there's two more questions. Dr. Yes. Reti, uh, do you consider that RH blood uh, factor blood protein could be important? RH factor is a blood protein that plays a critical role in some pregnancies. For example, if a woman who is RH negative is pregnant with a fetus who is RH positive, her body will make antibodies against the fetus blood. Do you know if this factor has been studied? 
you know, it's a uh, it's very relevant. I was also thinking about that for another project that I have, uh, but I am not aware of studies into into this. I know there are studies on blood. Uh, blood groups, but I haven't so claiming that there are certain blood groups that are more vulnerable to COVID, but I don't remember seeing the data on the R uh, RH uh, factor and for sure not divided into men and women. So I'm, I'm taking notes <laughs> because this could be really um, another thing that uh, as soon as data are available, we should look at. Yeah, thank you. The next question is IL-6 and estrogens. Do you check estrogen inhibition of IL-6 production? So if estrogen inhibits interleukin-6 production, that's the idea, I guess. Yeah. Um, so um, we, we should check this. The, the regulation of um, the hormonal regulation of these um, cytokines and in general immune mediators is, is very complicated. So. I'm not 100% sure that what they will get is an inhibition of uh, interleukin-6. Not 100% sure that will be the effect, but we have to test it and, and see if uh, that's what will happen. Yeah. Okay, then that will be everything. Uh. <laughs> that is time, that Isabel, is that is time. Just in time, like if we were <laughs> British. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I lived in Switzerland for seven <laughs> years, so the result is that I'm almost Swiss. <laughs> and it shows. Well, we, are, <laughs> we are moving to the Switzerland main. And, yeah. and uh, thank you all attendees from, uh, and uh, I, I hope that this uh, session could be for, uh, it's, it fulfill all your expectation, because really for me, it's, it could be very, very interesting. Um, and uh, thank you again, Teresa, Maria Teresa, to attend this meeting. And um, I, I implore you for the next time, not <laughs> only in the Women's Brain Project, it's a Barcelona Pittsburgh conference. See you and the next time with <laughs> my you. heart, with my love. Okay. Thank you. See you. The same okay. for me. And thanks thank to everybody you. who joined. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you for your bye. help. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.